So I'd love to introduce um, Blake Richards, who, uh, who's a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, he focuses on biology and neuroscience. He's actually trained at the University of Oxford, so another North American that we've dragged back. Um, <laughs> and has a number of collaborations here as well. He's uh, also a fellow at CIFAR. So with that, Blake, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Nathan. And uh, this, will, uh, this will be interesting. I, it's interesting following Francois, because uh, I, I have a slightly different perspective on some things than he does, and I'll, I'll try to articulate it. I, I think a lot of what he said is dead on, but um, let's, let's see where I go here. Because as you can tell from the title, I, I think actually deep learning has quite a bit to do with what goes on in the brain. And I think it's a pretty significant mischaracterization to say that it doesn't. So before I explain why, though, let's start with just the relationship between neuroscience and machine learning and what exactly it is ideally. Obviously, they are different disciplines. But the goal of neuroscience is ultimately to understand how natural systems lead to intelligent behavior. And the goal of machine learning is to engineer artificial systems that can engage in intelligent behavior. So obviously, we're concerned with very similar things. And in the ideal kind of virtuous research cycle, in my opinion, what should happen is that neuroscience will provide good priors and some of the, the sort of constraints on machine learning systems that will help us to narrow in our search space, as well as potential novel solutions to problems that we're currently having uh, issue with. And uh, at the same time, I think that machine learning can directly uh, help neuroscience, not only by providing mechanisms for data analysis, but also by helping us to reinterpret biological data and to think differently about what we see going on in the brain. And in part, to develop theories about how optimization might work in the brain and give us predictions for that, for, for what we should see biologically then. So, I mean, we can say that deep learning is one of the great examples of this, in fact. Deep learning was very much so influenced by neuroscience. The early uh, research into this done by people like Jeff Hinton, Yashua Bengio, Yan LeCun, et cetera, was very much so guided by some of what we had learned about sensory processing in the brain. And what I'm going to propose is that it can also now inform our understanding of the brain to kind of complete that cycle from machine learning back to neuroscience. Uh, and I think that if we can complete that cycle and we can keep building off of each other, we can eventually uh, understand biological learning much better, and that will hopefully help us to develop better AI systems as well. Now, as you know, deep learning has had a big impact on artificial intelligence, and we finally have the ability to rival humans in pattern recognition and control. And I agree with Francois's characterization of most of the deep learning systems that exist today is basically being pattern recognition. Um, and there's a lot of hype and a lot of mischaracterization. The, the impressive things that we've achieved are often over-exaggerated in the media, and the relationship to the brain is also overly simplified. So let's be really clear about what we're actually talking about when we talk about deep learning. Um, so <laughs> does the brain engage in deep learning? Now, so this is where I'm going to part ways with Francois. So I think that what you defined was deep supervised learning. And you maybe also weren't quite fair in terms of, of what, we, what we understand deep learning to be. I think it's slightly broader. So at its heart, of course, most of, our, most of us are familiar with this sort of deep learning that's illustrated on the bottom of this slide, where you've got just stacks of linear, nonlinear operations on some data. And effectively, you're just doing regression. And this was motivated by an analogy to the brain to some extent, because what we see in the brain is a series of progressive operations where you start off with very complicated, highly entwined sensory data, your crumpled ball. And when you look at the manifolds that exist in neural data higher up in the sensory streams, those balls have been unfolded and smoothed out for you. Now, at the same time, we know that the brain does a lot more than that. So one interesting thing, for example, which I wish I had a slide on, but I didn't know this was going to be such a topic at this uh, conference. I probably should have guessed, <laughs> is the adversarial image example. So you might be interested to know that if you show people 
adversarial images that can fool a large number of neural networks, but you show it to them for only a brief period of time, a few hundred milliseconds, it also fools people. Where we don't get fooled is when we have the time to process it and to stare at it longer and to engage in some inference, inference processes that clearly don't happen in these deep neural networks. So to some extent, trivially, we're obviously something quite much more than the deep learning networks that we currently have. So why would I even bother proposing that the brain engages in deep learning? Well, my understanding of what deep learning is is something slightly broader. I think that this understanding of deep learning as being simply supervised training in a differentiable system uh, through a series of linear, nonlinear transforms is not quite what the original researchers had in mind, and it's not quite what we can characterize the entire research program as about. Instead, I would argue that what we mean when we talk about deep learning is fundamentally end-to-end -end optimization. So if, and, and that's why we call it deep learning as opposed to shallow learning, it's that you have a system where every stage of your processing hierarchy is engaged in the optimization. So if you are a neural network and you're gonna to try to learn some transform on your data, every layer in the network is contributing to your optimization on your objective function. And so when we ask, does the brain engage in deep learning? What we're asking is that if we look at this hierarchy that exists in the brain, from the early primary sensory areas up to the higher order sensory areas, we're asking, do they all work together to achieve the same objective? Are they all optimizing on the same objective function? So let me give you a concrete example. Let's say you're learning to play violin. Now, obviously, your ability to play violin fundamentally just depends upon your motor cortex. It's your hand movements that matter. But your auditory cortex could probably help you to play violin as well. If you have a, an auditory cortex with representations that are refined around the particular notes that, such that you can very quickly adjust your fingers if you're in slightly the wrong position or adjust the strength with, with which you're moving the bow, et cetera, that could help you. So when we ask, does the brain engage in deep learning, we're asking, if you learn to play violin, does your auditory cortex also update itself in a way that helps you to play violin? Or is it simply that your motor cortex is learning by itself? And so I think that probably your auditory cortex is also updating itself. Put another way, let's say we take two people. One person practices violin for a thousand hours. The other person listens to a recording of that person playing violin for a thousand hours. Their sensory data at the auditory level is equivalent, but they have different goals and different motor programs that they're unfolding. And I would argue that probably they're gonna have different auditory representations, even though they've received the same auditory data. Now, why do I think that? Well, there's actually some evidence for this in neuroscience. So one of the things that's come out, a lot, uh, out of a series of papers from a variety of labs in neuroscience recently is that Neural networks trained with end-to-end -end optimization techniques match neural data recorded from primates and humans and rodents better than any of the models we have in neuroscience to date, which should certainly give us pause. So what you're looking at here is a plot of the variance explained in recordings from monkeys' brains. There's two regions we're looking at, V4, which is a kind of midpoint in the visual processing pathway for monkeys, and IT, which is a very higher order region where object categorization occurs and those manifolds have been smoothed out very nicely for you. And what's interesting is that, so at the green, you've got some trivial models. Don't worry about those. The black shows you various models that have been proposed by neuroscientists. So these are computational models where people have actively tried to fit what they're doing to what we know about the brain. And you can see how much of the data we successfully explain in our neural recordings with these models. In the red, you see a convolutional neural network trained with an end-to-end -end optimization technique. And in the middle parts of the layer, we have better fits to this region V4 than any of the neuroscience models. And in the upper parts of the network, we have a better fit to this region IT than any of the neuroscience models. 
And critically, these deep neural networks were not trained to match the neural data. Let me just stipulate that clearly. It is not the case that they're simply fitting the data trivially. These networks were trained on a separate task. They were trained to categorize objects, and yet they match the data better than any of our neuroscience models. Why? I think it's because the key thing that's missing from our neuroscience models is end-to-end -end optimization. Now, why don't we have end-to-end -end optimization in our neuroscience models? The reason is because most people think that you can only do end-to-end -end optimization with backpropagation. And that's why often deep learning gets characterized as simply learning differentiable functions. Because it is the most obvious solution to end-to-end -end optimization. If we are going to do end-to-end -end optimization in this way, we're going to have to calculate the partial derivative of our cost function with respect to the synaptic weights in our network. Now, don't worry about all these equations. They're up there for people who are already familiar with them, just to get you on board as to where I'm going. Basically, the only equation I really want you to worry about is the one at the bottom. So here we've got a neural network with input x. It runs through synaptic weights, w0 and then w1, to output y and then we have some target. Now, this is the key equation for backpropagation. And it is the equation that underpins pretty much 95% of the deep learning models that exist out there. There are extensions to it, and when you've got many layers, it's basically just a recursive extension of this equation. But this is the basic equation. And so what we have here is we've got an error. So it's the difference between our output and what we were looking for. We've got the downstream synaptic weights in our network. We've got the derivative of our unit's activities in this layer. And that's, this is part of why you know, we need a differentiable network. And we are assuming that we have a forward pass through our neural network followed by a backward pass with this error. Now the problem is that all of this is biologically problematic. <laughs> So there's no evidence for error terms being passed backwards through the brain. The transpose of our downstream weights is completely impossible. There's no way that, say, your primary visual cortex could know all of the synaptic weights in the downstream parts of your brain. Uh, the derivative of the activation function is very problematic when you're working with non-differentiable functions, which we are in neuroscience, because neurons communicate with these impulses called action potentials or spikes, and they're not necessarily differentiable. And there's no evidence for separate forward and backward passes through the networks. Now, because of this, neuroscientists have basically said since the 80s, all of this neural network stuff has nothing to do with the brain. We don't have to worry about it. And it's only been recently that people have started paying attention again because these models end up being a better fit to neural data than any of the models we've developed in neuroscience. So uh, what are we going to do about the fact, though, that all of these things are biologically problematic? Well, it turns out that every one of these problems is surmountable. And this is part of what the research has been in my lab uh, over the last couple of years, is that none of them are really an issue. We think we need these because we think we need to use backpropagation of error to do end-to-end -end optimization, but we don't. So let's start with this one. So here you're looking at a picture of a type of neuron called a pyramidal neuron in a mouse's brain. Uh, there's actually four of these neurons here. They've been filled uh, by a fluorescent dye uh, by my student, Matt Tran. And uh, at the bottom, the little kind of like triangular bit is the cell body where the cell's DNA exists. And uh, then all of those little wiry things are branches called dendrites. And those dendrites are where these neurons ultimately receive their inputs and where they process information. And this beautiful tree-like structure is really fascinating because what happens in the biology is that the different input streams to these neurons are separated into different branches on these neurons. So at the base here, surrounding that cell body where the DNA is, we have what we call the basal dendrites. These sit deeper in your neocortex. And 
they are fairly electrically, if you will, close to the cell body, which is where the outputs get generated. At the same time, there's another, another set of dendrites that are quite far from the cell body in this sort of treetop-like structure called the apical tuft dendrites. And they branch out at the surface of your brain. And what's interesting is that when you look at the inputs, they receive different inputs. So feed-forward sensory information about what's happening at your sensory receptors tends to come into those basal dendrites. Meanwhile, all of the feedback from the higher order brain regions tends to come into those apical tuft dendrites. And it's been a mystery in neuroscience for years as to why the brain would bother doing this. Why would you separate out your inputs like this and stick them in different branches? Well, it turns out that by separating the inputs like this, what happens is, is that these neurons end up giving different outputs depending upon whether or not the basal dendrites have been activated or the apical tuft dendrites. So here you're looking at a biophysical simulation of one of these neurons with synaptic inputs shown in blue dots on the basal dendrites and the tuft dendrites. And if you receive inputs to just the tuft dendrites, which is shown on the bottom here, you get what's known as one of these spikes, a little impulse that the neuron sends out to all its buddies. If, however, the neuron receives a combination of basal inputs and apical tuft inputs, then it elicits a burst of impulses. And this burst of impulses can have very different effects downstream, depending upon which types of neurons are listening to it. Now what this means, and in fact, interestingly, if you just get inputs to the tuft dendrites, the cell doesn't even respond. So what's interesting about this is that real neurons multiplex their bottom-up and top-down signals. These impulses that they're sending out are effectively carrying two separate streams of information. Individual impulses, the spikes, are sending information about just the bottom-up sensory stuff. And top-down inputs are communicated with these bursts of spikes that will activate different pathways. And what that means is that you don't need separate forward and backward passes because the entire system is simultaneously sending these two streams of information together, and you don't need to run different passes through your network. Okay, so we don't need separate forward and backward passes. What about the derivative of the activation function? Well, all that the derivative of the activation function really tells us is that our units are in the dynamic range. So one of the things that you can do that we've kind of played with over the last few years is that if you take your activation function, the, one of the standard ones used in neural networks, less so today, but traditionally, is this sigmoid function shown in black here. So theoretically, what you need is the true derivative of this function, which is shown in red. But if you discard that derivative from your equation and you just replace it with an auxiliary function that is a very simple kind of indication of whether or not you're in the dynamic range of the units, which I show in blue, learning still works. And in fact, it seems to work better than normal. So if you train it on MNIST, for example, everyone's least favorite data set, um, you find that you can actually beat the true derivative uh, in your accuracy. Now, this isn't on a ConvNet. This is just on a fully connected net. Uh, and it's a, just a, a two hidden layer network. So you can do a lot better on MNIST with the true derivatives if you have a many, many layered network and a much larger network and convolutions and blah, 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 blah. But we're just trying to test the basic question. Do we need the true derivative? And the answer is you don't. And in fact, what we've shown is that if you have non-differentiable activation functions, you can use this same trick and learning still works perfectly well. Okay, so we don't need the derivative of the activation function. Do we need the transpose of the downstream weights? Well, uh, so my friend Tim Lillicrap and I, who he works at DeepMind now, we racked our brains about this problem forever because it seemed like the one that we couldn't get past. How are you going to do end-to-end -end optimization if you don't know something about the downstream network? So put another way, what we're, what we're talking about here is that if you're going to try to implement this in a neural network, what you can imagine is that you're going to need the situation at the top, which is that for each synapse in your feed-forward pass, which are colored here, color-coded, red, green, purple, 
you're going to need a corresponding synapse in your backward pathway, red, green, purple, that matches it perfectly. And that's what's biologically very unrealistic. We have no way of guaranteeing that the brain could do this. So Tim and I thought about it for a long time, and we thought, well, why don't we just learn those backwards weights? So put another way, we see the kind of uh, abstract network on the bottom here. We need a network where our forward weights are W1 and our backward weights are the transpose of W1. And let's just learn this. So Tim set out to build a neural network that could do this. And as a control case, what he did is he said, okay, I'm going to take a network where instead I'm going to use as my backwards weights a set of fixed random weights. And that's going to be my control case to compare this algorithm that I'm learning against. And theoretically, it's not going to work, right? Um, but strangely enough, learning worked quite well <laughs> in the control network. So even if you just leave the set of backwards weights as a random fixed set of weights, uh, you actually end up learning as well as or better than backprop on certain tasks. I should say we've tested this on ImageNet recently, and we haven't been uh, satisfied with the results. So there's still some research to do this way. But what's interesting is this effect. The reason that it seemed to work is that the feed forward weights actually aligned themselves with the backwards weights such that you ended up estimating the gradient. So on the right here, what I'm plotting is the angle between what this algorithm with the random weights prescribed for the weight updates and the vector of the weight updates prescribed by the true gradient. And what we found is that you know, if you take any two random vectors in a high dimensional space, they're going to be orthogonal to each other. And indeed, we started off with vectors that were 90 degrees to each other. But as time went on, as training went on, the angle between those two vectors collapsed. And eventually, the two out learning algorithms were actually pointing in roughly the same direction. So put another way, basically, it's not actually a hard constraint that you have to have the exact gradient. You don't have to have the exact backwards weights or anything like that. You just need something that's roughly in the right ballpark. And it's entirely plausible that the brain could do this. OK, so what about the error term? There's no evidence. There's some parts of the brain that are very much so passing around error terms. But in the region of the brain that we're interested in, the neocortex, there's not any explicit evidence for a downward pass with errors. So again, it turns out you can get around this in a kind of clever way. So imagine that you're learning something, and you've got a teacher who just occasionally gives you some guidance. They nudge you in the right direction. So let's say we're trying to learn this red <laughs> function here. And our initial attempt is this blue function. And occasionally, we just get nudged towards the correct answer by our teacher. Well, it turns out that you can then just take the temporal derivative of your activity, so the difference in time, between the time before you got the nudge and the time after you got the nudge. And this ends up estimating your error gradient for you. And if you send that activity back through the network and you let it reverberate through your network, you can use that signal. And the entire learning still works. So there's just an example with this simple regression problem. Um, now, just as a note, you can also do reinforcement learning with this system. If essentially every time you make some random action, you reward that and you say, OK, learn on this, you can learn with that temporal difference. Now, I've got to wrap up here. So it turns out any one, every one of these problems is surmountable. And what my lab's been doing is combining all of these insights to try to develop more biologically realistic models of end-to-end -end optimization in the brain. Um, so everyone's least favorite example, MNIST again. We have this network. We present images for 100 milliseconds of simulated time. We give the network a little nudge, uh, train it on 50,000 training images, keep 10,000 for validation. And then we look at what we can do on the test sets. Ultimately, we're learning with this bursting signal. So that top-down feedback signal that I talked about, it's a special signal that indicates when to learn. And we're learning with the temporal difference on that. And this provides us a means to do end-to-end -end optimization without any backpropagation. And in fact, on MNIST anyway, um, we can do slightly better than backprop um, in the training error and the test error. So it certainly seems like it's plausible 
that you could have a biologically realistic network that could do end-to-end -end optimization. So this is all interesting, but does it actually tell us anything for artificial intelligence? And I'm out of time here, but I've got one last slide. So there are several possible insights for AI that could be derived from a better understanding of end-to-end -end optimization in the brain. The first is new forms of energy efficient hardware. If you don't need differentiable functions, if you can just communicate with little impulses, you could theoretically save a lot of energy in your systems. And we know the brain is much more energy efficient than any of the neural network systems that we have to date. So this is one direction we could go. Another thing we could look at is new methods for regularization. The brain has, as Jeff Hinton is fond of reminding people, a stupid number of synapses. When you look at simply the number of data points you have in your life relative to the number of synapses you have in your brain, it's ridiculous. You should be overfitting everything, and yet you don't. So there's some kind of very efficient regularization method in your brain that we could probably learn a lot more about. And the last thing is to think about new types of units for neural networks, where perhaps you have multiple signals traveling through the network, multiplexing different information. And this could be another way to approach learning and end-to-end -end optimization. But the last thing I'll say is that one of the things that we know that the brain does way better than any of our current systems is unsupervised learning. And I think this is one of the main areas where neuroscience can inform artificial intelligence in the coming years, is if we can figure out how the brain is developing a model of the world simply by experiencing the data and by interacting with the world, then we will be I don't know, in a way better position to actually realize something like artificial general intelligence. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Thanks to my collaborators and funders. Time for maybe one or two questions. If anybody has a burning question. Yes, no. Simon at the front. Uh, fascinating. I think I've seen it before. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I'm fascinated even more the techno. Uh, do you think feedback alignment is what's actually happening in the brain? Right. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> because we haven't been able to scale it up to really hard problems. I think what feedback alignment tells us, and this is, I think, my main message, is that you do not need to actually follow the true gradient to do good end-to-end -end optimization necessarily. And so one of the research questions that I'm interested in and others like Yashua Benjo's group, Yashua Benjo's group are exploring uh, is essentially what are the sets, what information do you need to pass backwards? How much does it need to match the true gradient or is there some other way we can characterize the sort of information you need to really have truly scalable end-to-end -end optimization? Um, so the short answer is feedback alignment is not quite it. I think there's probably going to have to be some learning on the backwards weights. You're going to have to get into a slightly better space. Uh, hi, my name's Austin. I'm from the University of Cambridge. Um, you, you cited as evidence that the brain's doing end-to-end -end optimization, the fact that a, a network doing the same matches neural data. But is there any evidence just from the brain itself? that it's doing end-to-end -end optimization? Right, yeah, great question. So there's only very limited evidence. There was a study back in the 90s where they basically did the experiment that I proposed with the violin player. They had monkeys doing a, an auditory discrimination task and they looked at, uh, so essentially the monkeys had to do a little motor movement depending upon whether this tone matched the previous tone uh, and they looked at the representations around that tone in those monkeys versus a set of monkeys that listened to the recordings that the monkeys who were doing the task were doing but didn't actually have to perform the task. And they found that in fact there was a sharpening of the auditory representations around the target tone only in the monkey that was actively doing the task. Um, so there is some evidence for it, but it's been lacking. Part of the reason is, is that I think that neuroscience has bought for too long the idea that the brain is simply a self-organizing system, that everything is purely local, and that if you just have like, you know, some little simple game of lifestyle rule, everything's gonna miraculously give you intelligence. And, and I think part of what we're starting to realize, thanks to deep learning, 
is that it's important to have some kind of top-down optimi optimization routine. Um, so hopefully, we will start to see more experiments addressing that. And maybe I'm full of shit. And maybe, <laughs> maybe people will run more experiments to test this idea more, because one study does not make sufficient uh, evidence. Uh, maybe we won't find evidence for end-to-end -end optimization when we look for it directly in the future. But I'm going to bet a lot of money we will. Hi, I'm Robin from Similar.ai. Um, uh, the kind of learning you're talking about uh, sounds like um, slightly different than uh, the artificial neur neurons you have in, in deep learning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, alongside that, are the, uh, and also the, the um, uh, real life brain examples you're talking about mostly seem to be uh, multimodal learning, learning between d two different modalities. Mm -hmm. Are the different kinds of data sets, and like a lot of deep learning success has been kind of uh, learning the data exhaust of, of humanity, are the different types of data sets or uh, are the different ways of embodying um, uh, these new deep learning systems, which might also yeah. be useful for this type of learning? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Because I think that one of the things that uh, we often fail to appreciate when people say, well, look, these deep learning systems, they're nothing like the brain, is that we've never actually given them a fair shake because we've never given them the sort of data that a human actually receives. If you actually give a deep learning system a rich multimodal, multimodal world where it can interact with the environment and control objects and receive multiple different streams of information at once, who knows what kind of representations you're going to get and who knows what kind of robustness you're going to see. And I suspect that that's going to end up being another key part to developing much more sophisticated AI systems. So I would actually be willing to bet that you could achieve a lot more in AI if you simply took some of the existing methods and used it to learn in a much richer embodied system than just training it on ImageNet. So maybe a, a, uh, sorry, a toy domain for that might be uh, online games, which has had a lot of success. Yeah, so, so he just uh, s suggested a toy domain for that might be online games. And I think, I think that's right. Uh, but I think um, part of what we ideally want to really get at it is uh, not just uh, online games where you just receive the image, but what you really want is a full, rich world. Because part of what we might do, this is a final thought and then I'll give over the stage, part of a, a lot of what we might do is something that's called natural supervision. So um, we might, our unsupervised learning might actually consist of taking various data that we have and simply training ourselves to match it. So you learn to match, like say, predict visual stuff based upon your auditory stuff, or you learn to predict what sorts of things you're going to feel on your skin based upon the motor commands that you're giving. And these are ultimately just supervised problems. But if you structure your supervised learning in that way, I think you might have much more robust representations developed.